jump into it. So, um, you know, how did you come to to composing and and for sound design? Now, who does strictly composing and who does sound design and composing? Or for the right amount of money, you will do sound design. <laughs> I don't distinguish th that much. I, I say I do strictly composing, but a lot of my music is sound design-ish. Same. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You, you made a face there, so talk to me. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I, do, I do sound design, too. I mean, I do, do Foley and, and uh, you know, all, all that really sound design-y stuff. So, um, and for uh, installation art and theater, <coughs> it's... Um, Sometimes just pure sound design. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And how did you all come to composing? Were you three years old and said, "That's what I want to do," or did you come to it later in life, or just something happened? Twist of fate. You're supposed to be a basketball player, and then and and Helica was supposed to be a basketball player, I think. and then there was a situation. Something happened. Right. <laughs> um, I. In my case, I grew up as a violinist, and I started playing the violin when I was seven. I wanted to play the cello, but they told me my hands were too small, so I became a violinist. And uh, I grew up in, in Puerto Rico, and playing in the orchestras there, I never knew that you could write music. Um, I no now it sounds almost absurd to, to just say it, but it's, um, I had no idea that you could write music. Um, so in my late teens, I joined a band, and. My band was a string quintet and a singer with electronics. And one of the, of the gigs we had was to play for live cinema nights. And I was making music for the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And we did a message of the afternoon with Maya there. And so um, a lot of our first songs were written to those films. And that was my first encounter with writing music. And I was studying violin at the conservatory there. and I. Um, I, I knew I wanted to be a musician, but I knew that I didn't want it to be a concert violinist. So I was really interested in other instruments, started to, um, to teach myself how to play the cello, the, the accordion, the harp, and, and a friend of mine told me, why don't you study composition? And I was like, that's a thing? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was on my third year of violin and decided to switch to, to composing. And it's a really small department, three of us, um, when I got there. And yeah, I never looked back. Wow, okay, all right. Todd? Uh, well, I have very little training as a musician, actually. I, I uh, always loved making music, and I was in bands and wrote songs and loved to play with you know, four-track tape recorders and do multi-track recording as soon as I could. Um, but I actually trained as an actor, and I moved to New York to be an actor, and um, was also making music on the side and in a play, for a play that I was in, the director had seen or heard some of the music I made and she asked me to make, could she use some of the music as transitional stuff in the play? And I said, sure. And one of the other actors, his wife was a film editor and she got the CD that I had made of these little pieces of music and started using it as temp in a movie that she was cutting. And, um, you know, they, they tried to get a, you know, they tried to get a real composer to replace <laughs> it, and I guess they were just kind of like, well, it wasn't working out, and finally, like, well, why don't we just get that guy? And, uh, and that was my first uh, job uh, to a feature documentary. It was probably, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Um, and I somehow pulled it off, and so, you know, sort of continued from there. Wow. Wow. Faking it ever since. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right, Bill? Well, I'm from Hollis, Queens, and in my neighborhood um, and neighborhoods around, uh, there, everyone was in a band. There were a lot of bands. Jamaica Funk comes from where we're from. The people before us were, uh, Count Basie was in our neighborhood, James Brown's in, in our neighborhood. So, um, uh, uh, Roy Haynes, uh, mm -hmm. Willie Bobo. So, was, we, um, so we were surrounded by great musicians. And um, there was a neighborhood sound. Marcus Miller's from my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I played in different bands around the neighborhood. And then when I was in college, uh, I 
uh, at Howard, I've uh, played with some really fabulous musicians. Um, Shelton Beckman is now Broadway conductor. Um, uh, Angela Winbush. Um, mm. uh, just all sorts of really spectacular folks. And the folks before us there were Donnie Hathaway and Roberta Flack. And those. So at every turn there was, a, I've had a mentor actually who's pointed me in the right direction. Uh, whether it was an entertainment attorney who said you need to study this or, or you need to go see this. Or in terms of film, there was St. Clair Bourne who would come to see a performance art piece that I did and um, afterwards asked me, if, uh, said he wanted to work with me on a documentary, on a film. I said, what kind of film? He said, documentary. I said, I don't do a documentary. What is that? <laughs> and then he, uh, I went on tour with uh, Michelle and David Cello, because I was producing her and um, managing, managing her. Mm -hmm. We were in Sweden uh, doing a, a date. And at Soundcheck, the guy comes downstairs and says, if somebody wants to see you, and it was St. Clair Bourne. And I said, oh, OK, so you're gypsy like us. I get you, whatever, we're on. And from then on, he plugged me into just, he's, and he's, he was at the center of black filming, yeah. black documentary filmmaking. And he just introduced me to all sorts of people. And my first um, session uh, that he hooked me up with was uh, Kristen Johnson, who went on to work with, uh, um, well, she's a director now, as well as a cinematographer. And so this is her first directing gig. Barbara Coppola was in the next editing bay, you know, so St. Clair, it's all been about mentoring. And at every turn, someone's said, hey, come do this. Um, the first film I wrote for was in 1985. Um, uh, the Dougie Fresh is in, I forget the name of it. But, um, it was uh, produced by a local theater guy. And uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you need to do this. And I'm like, but I don't do that. And that's my, that used to be my answer. I don't do that. Now I say yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you definitely grew up in, in a legend, a musically legendary, oh, yeah. you know, um, neighborhood. Because then, of course, the I'm the least out musician out of all the guys that I know. You what? I said, I'm the least musician out of all the people. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Where are you? Don't say anything. <laughs> OK, so. Um, so, okay, so we have a, a background of like how you how you came to um, to this genre and how you came to composing and sound design. And so, what is the process? I mean, we got a little bit of a of a bird's eye view by looking at um, Bill's work because it had like the the subtitle, and I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense because I I had a. a, a I worked for um, a producer who came from Disney, and everything had to have a sting on it. And I'm like, we're doing news; it doesn't need a sting. But like, that was the thing. Like, every in, any music we put on it had to have a sting on the end, you know. So, um, you know, just talking about like, what is um, the process for for scoring a scoring a film? Let's start with Bill. Uh, well. What she didn't read on my bio is that I am an acolyte of Walter Murch. So everyone know who Walter Murch is? Walter Murch is one of the major theorists about editing, uh, film editing. He edited and sound design. He's what he coined the term sound design. He edited uh, Apocalypse Now and all sorts of stuff. I used to play the opening to Apocalypse Now in my uh, classes. I still do. Um, Walter Murch talks about how um, uh, it has the, every edit, which I include music and where you place it and what it's supposed to do, has to move the, for, the story forward. It has to be musical. I mean, it has to fit there. Yeah, and for me, you have to, I have to get out of the way of the dialogue because I think every word is important. Um, uh, and I start with trying to figure out what the story is about and how to serve what the story is about, really, more than anything else. And if the story lags, then that's where I come in to, to sort of juice it up a little bit. Or if it's, uh, and it, uh, sometimes I'm going with the rhythm of it, sometimes I'm going against the rhythm of it. 
Sometimes if it's zipping along, sometimes you need something underneath that's, you know. So um, uh, Walter Murch talks about uh, comprehension on the audience's part, that you can't put more information into a space than they can comprehend. And the, 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 um, the tool he uses is, his book is called In the Blink of an Eye. You have to read the book. And he talks about how if you're watching, he, he watches people watch his films. Like I, as a producer, I would watch people watch the artists that I'm working with. You know, I'm not watching the artist. And if, as, if you're watching a film and you watch when people blink, they blink at the end of a piece of information that they comprehend, like you just blinked. So uh, you have to space information such that people can comprehend it. You know, you all know you're sitting in an editing, editing bay and stuff is flying by and you know, you know that's, they're not gonna be able to get that. They're not gonna be able to comprehend that. The same thing with music. You can't add more information to the visuals and the dialogue <clears throat> than the audience can comprehend in the bite-sized pieces that they do, that they need to comprehend it in order to get the overall effect of the film. So that's, that's sort of my process. I, it's like stay out of the way, get in there, but you know, make sure that people are able to comprehend what they're, what they're watching. Do either of you all have something to add there? electronics along with acoustic instruments and the way I, I approach electronics it's mostly um, through acoustic sounds and sources uh, most of them found sounds so every time I'm gonna write a piece either it's for film or, or a concert piece I, I start by creating a sound bank so I record things mostly from my apartment from um, outside and and just interesting sounds and if it's for a film that I'm I kind of have that lens of course of, of what sounds I, I'm looking for and I create that that sound bank and then edit those and and then from there start composing um, in the in the latest uh, project I did which is Memories of a Panic Tintar the the trailer you saw for that one I I also I was very curious about the process of the filmmaker um, and actually how did how did the film was born? And because she found all these 16 millimeter films in in her mother's attic, and and she as she was explaining to me the process, she said, like, "Well, I have all of those things digitized, the audio. If you're interested." And I was like, oh. um, "That was like gold, kind of for me." So I started with going through all of those audio files and sampling things from there. Sometimes micro samples, like super tiny moments, and sometimes like longer things and a lot of those things never made it to the film, the, um, the actual audio of it, but then made it to the score of the film. Um, so there's a lot of the, of the kind of family, uh, the family's history embedded in the, in the music as part of the score. Um, so, and that's, um, that's part of, of how, of, of my approach, it's getting into the process of the filmmaker and also seeing what I can kind of extracts from it. Sometimes it's not as literal as sounds from it, but um, but I often find interesting things there that I end up that ended up making it to the score. I, so I'm imagining that you sample like someone's laughter, and then and then do something with that. Mm -hmm. Is that? Am I yeah. understanding? There was a there was a lot of since it was um, 16 millimeter. The quality was. Uh, Beautifully raw, and and that's part of my aesthetic too. So it worked out really nicely. Um, but there's a there's like um, a lot of birds. There's some videotapes rolling. There's some audio interviews with Miguel, um, her uncle. Um, there's a lot of religious, uh, like Catholic songs, because his mom had a radio show, and and so there's a lot of songs. And so maybe I took like a two seconds of, um, of a chorus of that song and then like processed it and made a pad with it or something like that. But um, I'm really into taking sounds and then recontextualizing them and, and, and seeing what other life they can have after that. Thank you, thank you. Tell. 
I think for me, the uh, every project is a little bit different. Every project is different. And when I said that I was faking it, it's true, but it was really true um, for a long time uh, before I went to the Sundance Composers Lab because I had been working for almost 10 years before I went to the Sundance Composers Lab, and I thought, and they, you know, they 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 bring like a bunch of kind of famous Hollywood composers and they bring other directors, and I thought that I was going to sort of, I had made it. I had faked it long enough that I was going to finally like find out what the secret was, um, you know, and and basically I was kind of home free because I had no one had found out that I didn't know what I was doing until then, and uh, but when I got there I found out that every you know my experience, which was that basically you kind of have to build the language of the film each time fresh, and there are no sort of off the shelf solutions for the process of collaborating with a director was true even for people who were working sort of within, you know, sort of established Hollywood genres. Um, and that the most important thing was establishing a language with the people you're collaborating with, the director and with the editor, whoever is going to, the producers, whoever's going to be your sort of primary person that you're sort of bouncing stuff off of and that language is created kind of fresh every time and and it and it's you have to create it by example um, by you know listening to music together and saying you know because when the director says oh I really hear something that sounds you know really driving but also incredibly sad you know that could just mean anything and but if you're listening to music together and you say, you know, oh, I really like this part. Really speaks to me about what I what I imagine for this movie. Then you can you can sort of identify it as a as a composer and say, oh, okay. When you know when the director says she wants something that is driving, that's the kind of thing that is that those words are attached to for her. And uh, that is probably to me the most important part of composing. Um, is is that listening and creating a you know in the same way that Angelica talks about kind of creating a very specific sonic world from whatever materials are coming in? I think that is also created just in your language about the film. So. Yeah, I think. Uh, thank you so much for that about the language because you know you're actually talking with someone be it your editor or even your DP, and you, you have a vision for yourself, but like unless that person actually understands what you mean by, you know, I want a sun-kissed look, or I need, you know, a, you know um, a morning shot or something like that, you know, a dawn shot or something like that, then, then they're like, I don't know what that, you know, they come back and you're like, okay, we clearly are not on the same page here, right? So I love that about, about the language. Yeah, OK. So, all right, I'm learning so much already. <laughs> this is awesome. OK, so um, all right, so we kind of already went over the, like, the kind of conversations um, that you have with the, the, are you speaking with the director or mostly the editor or a combination or the producer? You know, Todd, you talked a little bit about that. But like, who, who are you talking to? Who, who do you have to listen to? Is probably more more to the point. Okay, all right. The producer. <laughs> I mean, those fundamental conversations, creative conversations, are generally with the director. Okay. Well, it's always with the director. Um, but there are situations where the producer actually is the boss and is the boss of the director. And there, I have done movies where I never talk to the director. You know, I've talked initially with the director, then all of the back and forth is with the editor because the editor is really in the in the director's head. Um, that's when I, you know, and also it just depends on whether I'm working on a movie that is in progress or locked because I do both, and there's sort of different processes. Okay. Um, same here. I I find that often I'm, I'm in between director and, and editor often, but I think oh, um, what you mentioned before about the language is it's so important to, be, to build that kind of, as I talked about building a sound back or, or a sonic world, also building a vocabulary together. 
um, is really helpful because um, there's words that, uh, at least for me in music, mean something very specific, and then you go there, and then it's like, well, no, that was not it. Like, for in example, intensity. I can't tell you how many <laughs> um, revisions I've done to cues because of that word. Um, it might mean, for me, it means more layers or, or volume, but sometimes it's, it's more of a feeling, and it it's not, doesn't really have to do with, with texture or, or layers. So, um, so like making sure that you're on the same page, I think, really helps. And, and also, I think that when, <coughs> when the director is kind of uh, is familiar with your music, it also helps a lot. Um, like I've had one film in which it was tempt to my music, which is an exception. <laughs> never, never has happened to me before. But then that really, you know, first it tells me that you really want to work with me, you like my my sound. But also it, um, it let it's very specific and like oh I can do this kind of things and I and I know where to go because it's a reference from my own music and not that I'm going to copy that but I'm I I really know what to do with this next I don't I don't need to copy Philip Glass for this um, for a change so which I don't know if anyone else has that curse but <laughs> for documentary sometimes it's um, it's always there but yeah so building that vocabulary and and yeah it depends on the project whether it's director or or editor. I've never had the producer um, thing, but <laughs> yeah, I know it's out there. <laughs> Where? Um, with St. Clair, actually, who's a, you know, uh, well-respected director, but at the last maybe a week and a half before the film was supposed to air, that one, actually, the American Masters film, Susan Lacey walks in and wants it re-cut, re and we had to um, shuffle scenes around, add scenes that weren't in uh, several months of cuts, and um, I had to add, I had, well, I, one, one of the th smartest things that St. Clair had done was involve me from the very beginning of the process. The earlier you're in, the more you know about what's left on the uh, cutting room floor, and more about what informs the story. So uh, while I was composing the music, I would compose several versions of each cue. And it, just to do it, to have it. Uh, and it turns out that when Susan Lacey came in at the last minute and said, we need, we need to recut the film, I had extra cues prepared, which rarely happens because usually or often I'm called in a fine cut, but that's not great. It, it, choose, your, choose your composer when you choose your cinematographer, and uh, you'll get a much better product. Because it's not knitting, it's needlepoint. You know, by the time, uh, as much time as you spend on the film as a piece of art, we would like to spend that much time <laughs> thinking about or working on the music, you know, and bring, in, bring, you, uh, bring us in at the, uh, at the assembly, bring us in at the rough cut, the second rough cut, at the fine cut, and you'll get a much more coherent and cohesive piece at the end. So um, uh, each project is different. No one, I've never been in a situation, no, there's been in one more situation where the producer had that kind of sway. But generally it's the, uh, it's the director. And if you have a really, if you have a first time director and a strong editor, then it's the editor. So. Uh, I don't have a particular sound, so every film is completely different in that way. So you have to know who, you know, if you're a musician, you're, half your job is listening, more than half. So you listen to who's talking, who's, who's in charge, and who's got the best artistic vision. Because if you're a director who relies on the team, then the team will come together and bring home a great film. It doesn't, you don't have to necessarily have a director with a really strong vision, but just someone who can really bring the whole project home. So everything is, everyone is different. And, is, and there's no, n one is not better than the other. So then, wh so what does, okay, now I have my producer hat on and I'm like, oh my God, bring you on, bring the composer on at the beginning. Chiching, like there's just like dollar signs just like went off in my head. So, so then <laughs> I'm like, ah. 
So, but what does, what does that look like? What would you be doing? So like we're having just a conversation about it and we're, we're starting that language of, all right, this is kind of the music that I was thinking. And, and so like, what, do, what does that look like? We'll start with Bill since you brought it up. Well, um, you can, I don't know what your shooting ratio, ra ratios are, but usually they're, they're at least eight to one. You know, and for documentaries, they can be, you know, 20 to 1. So there's all this stuff that might, you get this little snippet in the film, but it was part of a much larger story. And you can tell that um, you might not be able to, as an audience, figure out, okay, well, they, look, that's a little thing there, and it flies by like that. But if I know that it connects to something else there and connects to something else there, then when I introduce a theme at the beginning of the film and a little piece of it comes back for that little sliver that shows up there, that adds a coherence to all these patchwork images and ideas that are going across. And the music can connect the dots between the two. But if I don't see all that stuff, then I'm looking at it as a patchwork too. So I'm like, okay, this, what does that have to do with that? You know? So the more I know, the more I can serve the overall story arc. So. And it it's going to cost you the same at, uh, to bring me in early as it's going to to bring me in late. It's just going to drive my blood pressure up at the end, <laughs> and yours, because I'm right, not going to be able to get right. I'm not going to be able to take two passes or three passes at something. Right, right. Okay. Okay. If Anything I to continue? think of it as a sort of budget. Every movie takes six weeks, full time, hardcore six weeks of work, and that six weeks is much better parsed. Oh, you know put out over, you know, six months or so than squeezed into two and a half weeks, which I've also done. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so I'll, I'm usually working on many projects at once, but I'll say, okay, well here, you know, at the start, let's spend a week, and I'm gonna do a bunch of music, I'm gonna do 15 or 20 minutes of music, you know, whatever the point is that the director feels like, okay, I now I know what the sound of this movie, I know what I'm dealing with, I know what I wanna explore, I can, you know, sort of express what I want the music to be like. Um, at, th at that point, which is usually sort of early rough cut, you know, then it makes sense to just go in and do some exploration. And, I, and, then, and the, oh, you can also be just very free. If they know they're editing for six more months and it really is about you know, exploration, then we can try stuff that just doesn't work at all, like really crazy ideas. And uh, you know, generally I'll go in and I'll work for you know, four days a week or so and try to get you know, a half hour or 40 minutes of pretty finished music based on whatever our ideas are not to picture. Um, at all, and that serves to both let us sort of bat it around, and you know they can say, oh well, like I, I hate that instrument you're using. Let's avoid that, or I really love this thing that that was not what I expected, but I want to explore that more. And then also that can just be a pot of music that the editor can dip into, because a lot of times stuff that you think is not going to work at all works great, and stuff that you think is going to just knock it out of the park just sits in the movie like you know um, oatmeal, and so. Um, and then I'll go away and I'll kind of forget about the movie and I won't get tired of it like everybody else and I won't get stressed out about it like everybody else. And then, you know, later on, I'll come back and I'll spend another week at whatever point, you know, it seems to make sense for the, the project. Like, oh, we've sort of explored this, this thing and we want to go this direction. And so then by the time we get to, you know, from fine cut to lock to mix, you know, we have developed a language, we've sort of developed a, uh, a um, communication style and we've developed the language of the film and then that last run can be incredibly uh, productive and creative. Um, so that's an ideal, ideal yeah, thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I feel um, like that's definitely the ideal scenario and, and because of all those things you mentioned at the end, there's developing the language with the filmmaker, the communication, which sometimes you don't think about that, but like how are you going to communicate? Are you going to be on the phone every time um, she hears a new key? Are you going to be e replying by emails? Are, is she going to take a week, two weeks to reply? Is she going to reply immediately or call you freaking out? Or like you never know. So like that communication style, um, it's I think something that's 
really important in the process. And when you have only two or three weeks or, or very little time to not only compose, but also add all those other elements that really affect the music you write, um, sometimes that, that can be really draining emotionally and, and just you know take you out of it. And, and also you're seeing, it's at the same as with anything artistic, you're seeing it one, so many times that you stop listening at one point. Um, so, so I agree that that's um, the ideal scenario, and that exploration is a, it's, it's really valuable. Because um, in, in this project, I did memories, and I, I did a lot of, um, of things with. I had this idea of like recording my violin that needed repair, um, and I wanted to record it before I got it repaired, and it wouldn't tune. So I did a lot of like noises on the violin, and I and that was I was like, this is kind of out there. I don't know if she's gonna like this, and there's a lot of of layering of like things like that in the strings and and kind of out of tune playing with really slow movements so that you could hear detune very slowly and things like that and and to my surprise she loved that um so and then became a bi very big part part of the score if i had not had the time for exploration i don't think i would have gone there um i would have just gone more safe and like yeah i think this will work for this and but having that time to play and and to explore ideas that go, I, at least for me, feel like are more deeply connected to, to the essence of the film, I think it's essential. And I think people treat sound like the bald-headed stepchild, even on set. You know, you'll take a, long, a, lot, a lot of time setting up the camera and the lights, and then you say, okay, sound, come on in. <laughs> you know, that's, and if the film sounds lousy, then that's the difference between a really professional production and, and the amateur production. Because everyone, the camera's gonna look the same. You know, everyone's, everyone's film's gonna look right, but is it gonna sound right? right. You know, so. I mean, because all of us have sat through like muddy film, dark, you know, bad projection, but as long as you could hear, you could kind of like continue to be with the story. But if the sound was bad, you're like, uh, somebody do something, you know, just stop, just stop it. <laughs> like, somebody do something, you know, right? A lot of my right? sound design comes from people come, coming to me and saying, can you fix this sound? Yeah. Can, I can't hear this background noise, there's this, there's that, there's a hum, there's, can you fix that? And had you taken the time on the set and given the respect of the sound, the set sound people, then you've got pristine sound interacting with pristine music because my the noise floor working as a musician now is nothing you know so there's no hiss there's no you know our stuff is clean so and your audience is is listening after they see your film they're going to go see spielberg you know everything's crisp so it's like a, you know like a hit record the record before you is stevie wonder so your record better be that good so, you know, your movie has to dialogue with all the other things that people are seeing day in and day out every moment of their waking lives on their phones that are, you know, done by professional people who are taking the time, who have the money to do it right. So you should take the time to do it right. So it's been a while, but can you actually zero out that, um, that hiss in the background? I mean, um, can, have we come to, like, that point, you know, I ha certainly have worked with people who are like, oh no, we can fix it in post. I'm like, no, we can't <laughs> fix that in post. That's, that's not fixable. We have to actually reshoot that, you know? But I mean, you know, th that's been a minute. Can, you, can we actually take out that, um, that ringtone? It's all with artifacts, so I'm gonna take yeah, it, it out. It, it, it always messes with it a little bit. You can get it totally acceptable. Okay. And, I, and, and the, the bar is low because now what people relate to as authentic is stuff that's shot on your, your cell phone jumping around. You know, if you see somebody in a war zone and it's shot with a, a camera on sticks, you're like, okay, how real is that? But when you see, you know, the bomb goes off and the guy's cell phone shakes, the, uh, that's real. <laughs> so, you know, the, the quality of the image and the sound has a lot to do with um, the type of film you're doing and what role that 
sound or image is playing in the film as, as it relates to authenticity. So I, I, I like to leave stuff the way it is, quite frankly. You know, filmmakers always say, hey, can you fix that? I'm like, I can, but, you know, so this lets me know you're in New York, that you have the, these sounds in the background, you know, that you're not in Idaho. So leave them in. Um, okay, real instruments versus electronic, you know, sounds. We're gonna start off with you and Halaka. Did I get it right? Hi. Your, your name. My name, yeah. Okay, okay, <laughs> great. Um, yeah, I, I have very little experience with MIDI inst orchestral instruments because I love working with found sounds so much and I um, if I think of a uh, violin sound, I then most likely will find uh, a teapot in my house and then process that to make it sound a little bit more like a violin. I'm not aiming for a violin, but I, that's kind of what I'm thinking, so I, I will try another way of finding that sound. Um, so, so I work a lot with MIDI, but as a sampler, to bring in those found sounds and then put them there and use them as a keyboard. Um, and But I've never, written a score for instruments that are not real, I try to try to get away from it as much as possible. I've had, um, I've had moments in which I record a lot of instruments from my, uh, from, from the, my, like, w instruments that I play, and if not, I, I do like layering of an, of one instrument. So let's say this one was just cello, actually, and a lot of and I played some violin in it too. So cello, uh, the cello is recorded. There were tracks and cues that had like seven layers of cello. Um, so it's a bigger sound, but that it's only one instrument. Because so, I know that was another thing that you had, that you had in the questions, like about budgetary concerns in terms of instruments. But I've also recorded. Uh, I did a documentary like seven or eight years ago, that, and they wanted a full orchestra. So, and I was like, okay, we're, we're, doing, we're doing full orchestra and the budget was really limited. So um, I don't know if this is the best, this was the best choice on my part, but I cut my part of the, of, the <coughs> of the budget, my fee for composing and we got an orchestra. But, and then we found a way of making it work. I, I think I, I booked a rehearsal room <laughs> in the conservatory in Puerto Rico and I'm, I'm pretty sure that was not legal. But then we put the orchestra there and we brought a sound engineer to record there. So it was um, kind of DIY, um, um, guerrilla style, a little bit recording all those instruments. And I really don't like conducting, but then I had to conduct for that. Um, so I think it's a compromised thing. I, I would much rather do that than actually use not real instruments. But again, it's because I'm not well versed in that idiom. Um, I work with electronics in a different way. So. How many pieces? What's that? How many pieces in the orchestra? How many instruments mm -hmm. in the orchestra? 38. 38? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was a, it was a full Two. orchestra. Yeah. yeah. A big one. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. That's very I huge. Um, I don't know. It's, I think it, it was kind of this um, thing of being young and, and let's do this. And we have friends and that will, um, that were excited about the film. And I, they, got, they all got paid um, for playing. Well, also, of course, we had like, I think it was three hours of a session for a lot of cues. So that also meant that, for example, the parts had to be pristine, no time for errors or um, sending the music to the musicians before so they were able to practice it. Also maybe sometimes compromising the music in terms of like n not being able to do really syncopated things or complex things rhythmically because I knew we only had three hours to record all these cues. So there's other considerations. Um, so it's uh, always a balancing thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Todd? Uh, uh, you know, it's a really, it ends up being sort of a genre question. I mean, there, I've worked on some things, basically TV things, where there's an expectation of a sort of very traditional instrumentation, or there becomes an expectation of this sort of very, you know, recognizable sort of symphonic instrumentation and there are people who are very 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 good at that that can really you know do something for tv or whatever that sounds like sounds like an orchestra 
Um, I actually, I talked to the composer who did this movie, um, Tabloid, uh, it was an Errol Morris movie. Aaron Morris? Aaron Morris movie. And, and he was like, oh yeah, yeah, we did the movie was just, you know, it was all fake orchestra, you know, no one would ever know, of course, because people are talking. But um, then when we had to do the record of the movie, you know, we wanted to release a soundtrack, then I hired an orchestra. It cost me an arm and a leg, but it just sounded like dog shit. You know? so, so, you know, within the, concept, within the context, particularly of like a, something that's really going to be watched on TV, you can kind of get away with anyone with the skill to do that. But um, creatively, I just think it's death. I just could not imagine anything less interesting yeah. than a MIDI orchestra. Um, so. Well, I love orchestra. <laughs> um, well it, it, it depends on the project, but I, I um, you know, I'm, I'm part of a community of musicians and wonderful soloists and improvisers and, um, people who can play together and who often play together. So um, uh, if the project calls for it, um, I, don't, I don't mind augmenting um, real instruments with synthetic instruments. And that's sort of as a, I come out of pop music, and that's sort of what you do, you know? There's a, a lot, most, yeah, you can do the wall of sound thing, but you can double track uh, four strings and uh, uh, or uh, record it once and put a delay on it or something you know there uh, each timbre that you add to it says something and places it in a time and place and so you don't necessarily need uh, a huge orchestra unless unless you need a huge orchestra but for the most part you can do much smaller segments of it and with recording techniques, um, uh, you know, if you listen to uh, the Beatles, mm -hmm. you know, uh, up until their last album, they didn't really do an orchestra, but uh, they took the time. It's it, but it's you know, the sound is tremendous. The, the amount of stuff that they could cram into 16 tracks. You know, now we're using so, a lot more, so it's really how creatively you can layer things. And certain things, um, in music theory, certain things layer over top of other instruments, like uh, strings and woodwinds, mm -hmm. say X. And there's a weight to each of those things. You know, uh, uh, six strings sounds like this. 12 strings or six strings doubled sound, sound like that. Uh, you add. Uh, uh, a, a soft synth pad under that, and it takes it to 32 without having to add another six strings, you know? So, um, but it, for documentary, I think less is more very often. And, um, for narrative, yeah, maybe more is more. But for documentary, I'm, like I said, I'm trying to stay out of the way a lot, you know? So um, if, if it's not a film about that, then um, I can get away with um, augmenting um, live musicians with, um, with me. <laughs> or I'm playing everything, that, that, that's the other thing. But I do believe that um, uh, the more physical articulation outside of synthesizers, the better. Uh, so I use a lot of horn players in my stuff. Um, uh, that's because very often the, sto uh, the stories are about one person. So you have s somebody breathing through an instrument, it says something about it's a person. You know, there's nothing, uh, nothing more immediate and um, visceral than breath through an instrument. You know, even, and I'm a guitar player, so um, the guitar doesn't even do it, you know, but breath through an instrument does that. So. Uh, I also think of just personally I also think of like the cello as something that also like f frequently can stand for like one one person and like alone and and then I was also, I just also had a thought of like Prince you know he play like 1500 you know <laughs> instruments and so he could yes I play all the instruments on this on this record you know so so that's is that and what I should be thinking in terms of the like the lyric a film um, uh, there's a film vocabulary for music. 
you know, for uh, like for many years, French horn carried uh, melodies, and then um, uh, strings carried melodies, and so each era uh, there would be some soloist out there in Hollywood who was getting all the gigs, <laughs> and or or some composer who was doing you know uh, a lot of it. Uh, the Bernsteins, and you know, and they would use this timbre, these these sets of timbres, and that's part of your vocabulary now, you know. And around the world, people use even if you're in Japanese films, you know, you listen to Takamitsu, he's using the same timbres that the Hollywood guys are using, and he's on the other side of the world in a different language, you know. So there's film is a it's a international language that we all understand. We all know what it means when that shark music starts, you know, no matter where you are in the world, you know. We all know what it means when the, the stabbing, the, you know, you know, you know, that's, so there's stuff that in film, this means that, and you can't substitute for it, you know. So, and it's a shorthand. It saves you a lot of time and energy trying to think about it. You can say, oh yeah, well, it's a film, so this is supposed to happen there. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the psycho example because I, one thing that I think of is, um, as you were saying, like a lot of people are great at making not real instruments sound real, um, and I'm not great at that, but one of the things which I love about real instruments is that there's so many things about the physicality of the instrument that sometimes get lost in, if you're not really good at, at doing MIDI instruments. So like, for example, that um, besides the, har the tight and dissonant harmonies that are characteristic of that example, I think it's all about like just the, a bow really, that's really aggressive like just down bows, successive, like and that's something that it's all about for me, of the physicality of the instrument that makes that clip. Um, so, so yeah, I th maybe it's also growing up like playing in orchestras and more traditional um, environment of, of real instruments, but I, I, I just, I can't, for me, I can't find uh, the, the interest of like, making a MIDI violin sound that good, um, I would r much rather be m manipulating something else and, and seeing what I can do with it. But it's a very personal kind of... Well, I, I would think that the time that you take to try and have the MIDI sound like it, you're like, you know what? I could have just had my friend come over here, right. do it, yeah. and then we'd be moving I on. Either, I would never even try. The violin is, is a great example because you know, the string makes a sound. Yes but the wood vibrates, yeah. mm -hmm. and the air around the wood vibrates, and you're hearing all of that. Yeah. And uh, when you press uh, an algorithm on a computer, it can't do all of those, mm -hmm. it's too much, it's too complicated. Yeah. You know, you'd have to have, right. you know, a huge yeah. synthesizer. So each instrument, each real instrument, uh, vibrates quite a number of things, even the floor that, in the room that you're in. So I can play my acoustic guitar and it sounds huge. You know, I got a great guitar, but the, I'm playing on a wooden floor um, or on a rug if I wanted to sound some, like something different. But the vibrations of, of, of uh, live instruments allow you to do more with less because they take up a lot more sonic space. And you only got so, but so much sonic space in the mix on a, on a film because it, you've got at 1,000 hertz, you've got a lot of voice you got background noise, it's hissing up here at 16 and whatnot, and then, you know, so, uh, what are you gonna do with the rest of it? And where, where are you gonna place your music so that it doesn't compete um, frequency-wise with what's most important? Todd, did you wanna contribute? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I find, I, I work a lot with, I, I love working with real musicians and a lot of times I will bring someone in when I have an idea and especially someone who, I'm not a virtuoso in, instrumentalist on anything but I try to play everything but you know, I'll bring in someone when I have just a basic idea of what I want and I'll just have them, I'll have them record you know, this sort of melody I wrote and then say well what, you know, do you have ideas for harmonies and I'll have them record another take along with that and I'll just build up 15 tracks and I'll mute half of them and say okay just play along with the stuff that you, know, you originally played along with the first thing like that, that music that was in that Welcome to Leith clip was just this, vi this saxophone player that came and did this like you know sort of incredibly sort of guttural uh, you know sort of arpeggios and I just 
cut them up. I mean, he must have probably recorded an hour worth of music, and I took you know, 45 seconds of it, and I created you know a uh, you know um, you know it, a sort of a composition out of what he had done. Um, you, can't do one again. you can't. Yeah, you cannot make that. And also, it was just inspiring. You know, I was. You know, I. And I think with when you're working on you know, movies, you, you want to be inspired, and you want to inspire the director, and you want the director to inspire you, and you want to bring in musicians who come in and inspire you. And you know, I'm tired of myself by the end of the day. You know, all of my <laughs> ideas. I want someone to come in and bring something. Um, and so that, you know, really it's about capturing that moment of ins inspiration and, and excitement and then creating it into something that works with the film. And oftentimes I find myself then trying to de, uh, despecify like that expressiveness because actually the expressiveness of the instrumentalist gets in the way of it takes up too much space like Bill talked about you know there's only so much information you can have in a moment and a lot of times if it's the information of a musician feeling and expressing something too specifically it becomes muddy whereas if you take that somehow get that, you know, sort of the essence of that, but then obscure it. Um, you sort of maintain, you know, the soul of it without over, you know, over elaborating on, on the moment. Um, so it's an interesting sort of balance. I, and oftentimes in terms of the MIDI instruments, I often will mock things up with, with MIDI instruments or whatever, and then come, you know, have real musicians come in and replace those things. And very often the directors will say, I really prefer the samples. <laughs> because, because they sound less human. Because they less sound, they, they, they don't take up, they don't grab your interest. They don't like pull the audience out of it. Um, and they're just used to it. Soulless, unimaginative. Not necessarily, I mean, it's texture. You know, I, don't, I wouldn't listen, you know. I don't want to rag on many instruments too much. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. Okay, so we have um, inadvertently gone through many of my questions, so hold on. Um, ooh, this is a goodie. What do you wish filmmakers would do before they contact you? <laughs> it's true. Has, has every, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that happens to me is that I feel like people actually haven't Googled me. So they yeah. like come to talk to me and I'm like, uh, that's not what I do, but let me send you over here. So, I mean, you know, I would think, please listen to my music, listen to things I have done already. You know, so so is that? I was gonna say that um, I, it's very few moments that I've had that, but but I've had like emails of like oh, I saw you on a list of ten female composers you, you should know, know. <laughs> and right and and so um, you know li the most basic one listen to um, to your music and and also make sure that it's right for for your film not only think of like oh she seems like an indie composer and she's in a band and she's a and not so well known and maybe i could you know um, my budget fits more this and like that's not the only concern like just really make sure that the that my sound also um you think it's it's the right kind of pairing for your for your film yeah i think different composers are are different about this but there's nothing i love more than a director who calls me and says you know um this is probably just totally not what you do, but I liked your thing in this other movie, and I thought maybe you would be interested in this because, you know, you've never done what I want, but would you be interested in trying it? And that is my total dream. I mean, that was life animated. Um, you know, Roger Ross Williams was like, look, I really see, I want a techno score. I want this as like as hyper saturated electronic as possible um, 
you don't really do that, but everybody told me I should talk to you. Um, would you be interested? And I was just like, whatever I need to do to get this job, I want to do that, because that sounds like so fun. Um, you know, and he had a vision for it, like a real vision. I was like, I, we, this, uh, we can, I can do something I've never done before if I work with you. And that's what excites me, you know? Um, so that's what, I guess that, I want every director to do that. I think also, as you said, like have a clear vision of what, of, of um, not necessarily the role of music in, in your film, that's really helpful, but um, sometimes that just happens along the way in the collaboration, but a clear vision of the film. Because um, if the, the initial approach um, is, it's a little vague in, in what, in your vision of the film, then I might not be as interested in, in collaborating because I know that could be a recipe for disaster. Um. Well, I think I know what you mean, mm -hmm. but tell, tell us a little bit more can, in terms of like clear just when, vision. Just when you ask really basic questions of like your process for the film or what the film is about and, and if, if a f I know it sounds like maybe it's uh, it not happens a lot, it doesn't happen a lot, but it, I've had conversations with filmmakers that um, don't really know, um, I don't, I wouldn't say articulating, it's not articulating, it's just like, and maybe this has to do with the stage of the process they're in, you know, um, and I can understand that as an artist too, but, but it's really helpful when you have a clear vision of your project, because then I can start imagining the sound world for it. Okay. Okay. Um, so like, you're talking about people who have like a topic, but don't necessarily know how it's gonna like, uh, what we're gonna see on screen. Like, either, okay, you're... Or even other extreme cases of like, someone shot a bunch of cool things, but doesn't know what the story is. Okay. Um, you know, so things like that. Okay. I think That's that, fair. You know, when a director can say, this is what I'm doing with this movie, and this is how music amplifies that. You know, like for the example of Life Animated, you know, Roger was like, this movie is not a, you know, sort of observational look at autism. This, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm using all the filmmaking, you know, techniques I can to get to feel like we're in Owen's head, in the, the main character's head. You know, that is this movie, and we're going to do everything we can to do that. And then that, that you know, that sets you up, that's a challenge, and that's, and that's something to, that we can all look at the movie as we're working on and say, wait, are we doing that? Because it's, you know, the director is being very clear about, you know, and if you don't know yet, you don't know yet, but I think that's what you're shooting for. That's what you're going to get the best work out of the people you're working with through. Uh, well, most of the time people come to me, they, they know what they want, so. Uh, or at least they know what the film is about. Whether they get there or not is a whole other thing. But generally, uh, the most confusing ones are, for me are the ones that have multiple protagonists. So, because then you, it's hard to tell, it's hard to tell the, uh, the, the story musically across the arc of the film if you have all these different folks. Um, and if they're not uh, mapped out, you know, clearly. So that's always a, that's always a challenge. Um, you get there in the end, but it can get to be a little hodgepodgey. So, um, but mostly people know what, what their story's about. They know who the protagonist or um, whether the protagonist is a person or an era or a, or a company or a, you know, whatever, or a feeling, they, but they know what that, thing is at the center. And um, I don't necessarily uh, expect people to have ideas about music, because um, a lot of directors I've met with say, well, I don't know anything about music. But they do. People know a lot more about music than they think they do, because you've been listening to it since you were you know, in the womb. So uh, whether you can articulate it in a meeting about a film is, a, is different from, I don't know anything about music. And um, I think it's sort of on me to make sure that we get to that articulation. So, because that's, that's my territory, so. Okay. Um, last question, and then I'll open it up to you guys, oh, guys and ladies, um, which is about, you know, um, 
So you have music that's in the film, and then how does like the soundtrack come about? Is that strictly from like the producers, you know, um, you know, desire or or doing something to like monetize the film, or or is that, you know, or is that always a part of the original plan? With like the soundtrack of the music, like an an album of the music. The yes, movie? yes, yes, yes. But, and it's, and it kind of, it was not part of the original plan, but as I was working on the film, on the, on the music, I, I started to think like this would make a really good album and, and I would love to put it out. So, so it just, and it was more of a, a personal initiative and, and, and then because it's going to be on POV next year, it made sense to like release it around that time. So it was. It just kind of happened, but um, it's my first one, so and it's not out yet, so we'll see. I do them all. I, I, I mean, I try to try to sort of make some sort of record of all of the all of the scores I do. I don't get to them all, but um, I, I like doing it, um, and I always keep the right to do it if okay. if I can. There's no, mo there's no money. I mean, you can, it's not, mo it's not a monetizing thing because there's no money to be made. But I like to have the move, you know, the the music out there if I think it sort of stands on its own in a way. Um, sometimes I think the um, filmmakers think that there's money there, um, and so they kind of want to do it, but then they realize it's just a pain in the butt, and there, <laughs> you know, there isn't money there. So, you know, generally it's not, it's not a thing. But one of the things that you can do as an independent, if, if your budget is limited as a filmmaker, I think it, there's an expectation that the, the composer will maintain all of the rights in the music. Um, and, but if you're working with a broadcaster and it's a bigger budget, they will take copyright. So they will not, you know, then at that point, I don't have any control over what happens to that music afterwards. Um, it's worth something to me to control it even it's not worth money but i like you know i mean technically the music from you know life animated i couldn't even put up on my own website because i don't own it um uh so you know that's something that you should ex unless you're really paying a composer well that's something you can you should expect to let the composer have um, but it's also you know you, it can be sort of a negotiating thing well you know you can keep all the publishing and all of the copyright on the music just license it to my film right, right. that's right, right. Okay. Yeah, okay okay good deal but now no does do rights <laughs> revert back to you at some point for like no it's work for hire you own it you pay for it all right got it yeah. okay all right okay you don't do it. It's me. It's mine. Yeah, that's I, you should can be. use it in your film and only in your film. Okay. That's it. You want that to get someone else. What? <laughs> do you want that to get someone else? Okay. You know, or pay or pay for it. Right. But yeah. I've done only one work for my but it's as you said, it's a, a um then you pay for it. Then then it's a much a higher budget if, right. if I'm not gonna own the music. But right, I right. often try to own it. Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, all right, yes, all right. We're going straight with the questions. True. Uh, aside from Foley work and sound effects specifically, how would you define sound design? Mm. Sound design. Um, well, aside from it. Aside um, from, I mean, Foley work I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. special effects I'm familiar with. I'm wondering what all sound design Well, um, for me, uh, sound design, you know, I talked about the frequency spectrum. Um, uh, you've only got two ears. Well, the, the film is a, is a 2D experience, even though there are people moving in 3D. Um, if people are moving in 3D, it's your job as a sound designer to imply depth to some certain sounds. So uh, that means creating um, reverbs and things around aspects of the film that give it the three-dimensional thing. 
Um, but you have to know that what that sounds like and um, and what that sounds like in conjunction with the other elements that are in the film. So along the frequency spectrum, only certain things, certain aspects of uh, each individual sound, in order for them to be heard, maybe you don't get the full spectrum like a, like a, a cello. A cello has a very wide sonic spectrum. But if you're gonna put it in a film with someone talking and there's background noise and maybe you're gonna roll off all the highs on it, maybe you're gonna roll off most of the lows on it so you're gonna squeeze it down into this particular frequency range. So if that's a sound design. Um, and then maybe then you're gonna pan it over here so it's gonna sit over there. So now you've got it squished this way and you've moved it over here so it sits there by itself and now you can hear the the, the voice which is sitting dead center, even though the voice, if it's a man's voice like mine, it's gonna be in the same, spec, uh, same fr um, frequency spectrum as the cello, but now you'll be able to hear it clearly because what, you, what your ear knows is a cello, and your ear knows what a cello is, now it's, it's hearing only this much of the cello. So placing things in the pan spectrum, in the depth spectrum, and in the frequency spectrum, um, all those elements are what I consider sound design is about. And then if you can, or if, you, uh, or if, uh, if the project dictates, um, you trick the ear or you tease the ear. You know, you have something do something it's not supposed to do. So I, there's, a, there's a sound design thing on one of my clips that I sent in. So, um, uh, and if you want to draw attention to something that ordinarily you would not be able to hear as clearly, then that's a sound design spectrum. Like, you know, you see somebody smoking a cigarette and you hear the, the, the burn of the cigarette at the end because it's like way out here. You know, that's a, that's a sound design. Um, it's it's where, you want, where you want the ear and the eye to go in the frame. Uh, so. It's your job to sort of direct, sonically, to direct the eye to what you're, you know, it is movies, it's, a, it's talking pictures, so you gotta, the eye has to go where it's supposed to go. You don't want to be, have your ear take your eye off what you're supposed to be <laughs> looking at. So you, have, you can't distract from the main thread of what's going on there, so you put things where they need to be. So that's sort of sound design. I mean, I think a lot of times I think of sound design as the non-explicitly musical sonic elements and whatever they can be. And I can think of an example. I worked on a movie um, in which there was an there was an interview with Al Mazel's, the documentary filmmaker. And in Al's house, there he is his uh, pipes just went clank, 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 clank all the time. It was all interview, and. It was a terrible sound to for an interview because you know you're like hearing this clank clank. But there was also something really beautiful about that sound, and it was a sound that um, he his his persona in the movie and his position in the movie was um, you know as this sort of wise, warm, older figure. And we started taking his his pipes and just putting them over other interviews that didn't have anything to do with it. It was completely abstract sort of expressive idea and you would never know that this is happening but I think it created a cohesiveness to the sound world and it basically acted as a you know as a musical theme but it wasn't music um, and you know to me that that is also sound design you know that's that you know and it's in incredibly powerful because you don't n when you don't notice it and you cannot notice it um, much easier than you can not notice someone playing a French horn during, um, you know, uh, a scene. So I think it's a very powerful opportunity to use non-musical things expressively. That's interesting working with somebody like Maisel's, whose films are all about, uh, or almost direct cinema, and yeah, here you are totally. twisting it, uh, going in another direction. He didn't and notice that's a, either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like 
a lot of the times, and you mentioned, I think, something like this in the beginning, that um, that there, you don't see sometimes a clear distinction between sound, sound design and the score, and I find myself often in, in that. Um, I do see, see a clear separation, especially in what we were talking about before, in the depth and, and just uh, space, uh, spacing of the sounds and orientation. Um, but there's also, for me, I'm really intrigued in projects in which there's a lot of overlapping in, in, in the two. And sometimes I, um, I, when I try to separate the two I, and I think of like, oh, the score is more like thematic, or, but then sound design can be completely thematic as well. And, and uh, in the example you were saying before too, um, and I just, a couple of days ago, I saw, uh, I met with this uh, filmmaker and he's doing a documentary on a Mexican immigrant that, uh, that he wants to return to Mexico and something happens and he can't and he collects cans. Um, that's his daily routine, and that sound is, and it's it's become the soundtrack really for the film, and and they're placing it also in moments that he's not actually doing that action, um, and and he just wants one piece of music to kind of add on to that, but he's like, no, this is the soundtrack for the film, and and. I think especially because there's so, so much overlap of, of found sounds and, and things that could be thought of as sound design and, and music and, and my own work that I that it's uh, that I am really drawn to um, films that and and also music that uses that that kind of that there's no clear distinction between the two. Um, also a big fan of like even though I love melodies and, and harmonies and I'm also a big fan of a lot of like early 20th century experimental composers and like John Cage and people that thought of like music as all the sounds around us and that there's no clear distinction between noise and 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 music and and that like reading a lot of John Cage and, and listening to a lot of like electronic music pioneers like Paulino Oliveros have really opened my ears and, and eyes to like an awareness of all sounds as possibilities for musical material. And read and look up merch. See, watch the beginning of uh, Apocalypse Now. That's a that's like a tutorial in sound design. M U M U R C H. Walter merch. The helicopters. The helicopters. It's 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 incredible. So um, along with you said, uh, Bill, you get uh, a composer in early. Uh, my recent film, uh, I had a composer come in and he just watched. Scenes, um, and then us having a conversation afterward. Uh, he spoke to how much he was inspired by the actors and had a sense of the rhythm of the scene and uh, where I was going. Um, my question is in terms of me thinking about how I can be more effective uh, by utilizing someone in the room uh, with a skill set at that point in time. I make a reference to a, a working with a cinematographer. Right, so you have a lookbook, okay? Uh, and so what would a, an audio book or, or, or a, a, a musical book sound like for you or what would be the important parts to make the process uh, more effective, work more the brain? Yeah, I, I get temp music a lot, um, and usually it's pretty bad. It's uh, more, more recently than in the past because now you can go online and get tent music and it's people are just using it as placeholders so um, it's it's much better to uh, um, just let me get take a shot at it and then you can listen and go okay that's in the right direction that's not in the right direction if you start early enough you can do that um, uh, but um, bringing it to the table unless you're really good at it and you know what you're doing then yeah you know if you know this is you want Dvorak or something that sounds like that here then that's great but um, uh, so that that's it's it, it really depends on the the skill set of the director uh, what uh, how deeply they uh, uh, they know their musical side I, like I've worked with some direct like St. Clair Bourne knows his music knew his music backwards and forwards and could tell you you know composers eras time you know all that kind of stuff so the more you know 
the more we all know sitting in the room, you know, I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room, especially if it's not my film. <laughs> so the more you know coming to the table, the better. You asked before about things that you want a filmmaker to come um, with, and maybe this is something I don't want filmmakers to come in, but one thing that, um, that has happened is the, the, the curse of the temp. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the curse of the temp track of like, um, if it's great when a filmmaker is not married to the temp track because sometimes they um, come in and, and, and they've seen this with this music so many times that it's one thing to get used to it, but another thing is to be really attached to it and like, and then you try your best to and keep revising that cue, but it, it was really all, always about the temp track. So I think um, it's important for for, to have like an awareness of like the temp track of the role of the temp track and also be open to like if you want to work um, with a composer that that's going to be their interpretation of it and and not <clears throat> yeah not kind of if you're going to use a temp track I, I think uh, I've I don't think I've I only one time I've I, ha I have seen something without a temp track um, but I've had various degrees of like this project uh, that I talked about the orchestra one was um, bless you, was all tempt to Philip Glass. <laughs> That's why I mentioned him before. And it was, and it was like just do something like this, and then how can you make something that sounds like? If there's one composer that you can get away with <laughs> if, for that is Philip Glass. It sounds like Philip Glass is going to be Philip Glass. Um, so, so then it takes. I think it, it just takes longer to get that trust between the collaborators of like. But you like my music too. What do you like about my music? Uh, maybe there's some overlaps with Philip Glass there, and we start from there, and then we build something that's unique. But I think it's important to 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 be open that what you might have in your head as the vision of the film, of the sound world of the film, if you have a temp track, it's gonna change hopefully for the better if you ha if you hire someone that you're excited to to collaborate with. Let me just throw this out to you all. So I was also thinking when you're writing, you know, when you're working with the words or the proposal, you might have, like as, as the writer or the director, you have like a, a song in your head for that person. So then can I come to you and say, okay, this person does, um, you know, Pharrell happy. This, this is the happy person right here. You know, that sort of thing. Um, would, it, would it be helpful to say like, this is what that character, this, this character listens to this kind of music. Obviously that can happen in narrative because you're creating that. But then if you're working over time with, with different subjects, you also get a sense of like what kind of music they, they listen to and like who, who they are and what they like and that sort of thing. So it gives you kind of like a mood. Would that, and that's what I was thinking of in terms of like, I can come to you and say, okay, these are the characters, these are kind of like, their songs, you know, of like who they are, and would that be helpful? I think that kind of thing is awesome. Like the, the idea of like a lookbook of sound, I think is just great. Like when I someone we're working on a scene and someone emails me, you know, that says, "Here's this, you know, YouTube video of this, you know, weird, you know, Belgian techno song," and I know that we're doing, you know, tango music, but there's something about <laughs> this that speaks to me in this abstract way, does it, do, do, can you hear what I'm saying? And it's really just that percussion part that I like. And that kind of thing is totally inspiring, whereas if they had found like the perfect piece of temp music that expressed all those things and stuck it in the movie and I was supposed to replace it, that would be, that, that's incredibly uninspiring. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, okay, and you always, you know. So temp music is great when it doesn't actually work in the movie that it's thought of as the beginning of a conversation with the with the composer it does not work when it's perfect um, or when it's terrible and the director doesn't know um, you know it, the idea of like replacing the temp is just you know can imagine if you were like working with an actor and right before they did the scene, you were like, okay, well, actually, we mocked up a version of, you know, of, of, of Hugh Jackman doing this scene, and I want you to watch this. 
okay, now, you know, give me what you got. Um, that's what temp music feels like, you know, and those conversations are incredibly annoying. And one of the great, one of the skills you need as a composer is to be able to have those conversations with a straight face. Um, and so if, you, if your composer has a straight face, when you're having that incredibly annoying conversation, you're working with a pro. Because really they're thinking, I want to strangle you. Sheila, do you still have questions? Yeah, you guys almost answered all my questions, but I'm kind of interested in the organization, how to get stuff to you in an easy manner, the tools you like, just as part of the production process. If people don't think about that, and then keeps it all you know, I just want to find out what makes it easier and then it helps it to other Paper cut helps. Um, that helps a lot. I don't see it very much anymore because people aren't trained that way. But you used to, you used to be able to get a script with a paper cut, and you could go, okay. And you know now, you get the film. <laughs> but um, I've got to chart stuff in um, Excel basically to keep up with what I'm doing because. I don't necessarily write in a straight line, and maybe I'm going back to this and that around, or you know, I get inspiration from this, and so then I got to figure out well, which cue did I leave out. So, if I can match my my spreadsheet with with your chart or whatever your organizational paper organizational tool is, that that really helps. I find it incredibly helpful when a film production is organized, and it's generally the editor and or assistant editor that's tracking this stuff, tra basically, you know, a, a movie should have a, a musical cue sheet that's, you know, sort of developing as the cut, you know, becomes more and closer and closer to lock, you know, with what cue is currently in there, what cue the, the composer has, like, put forward as a proposal, you know, what people think of that, and, you know, you can sort of go through and see where you are as it goes on. Um, when that's not there, I kind of have to do it, and it burns a bunch of my time and energy. Uh, just any, it, all of those organizational things are really important to maintaining the energy focused on the creativity. Um, and I had, I really had to learn that I'm not a naturally organized person, but it's, it, I realized that it was incredibly important for me to be very, very organized about what I was recording and what I was doing, um, or else I would, at the very time you cannot afford it, at the end of the process, you're spending, you know, 45 minutes trying to figure out which project had that little thing that the director liked from two months ago. Um, so. Yeah, and like starting the process with finding what workflow works best for both sides because it might be different for each project and like how you're gonna um, access the files things like that um, what's gonna if there's gonna be a file name in convention between the director and you um, for revisions it could get really tricky if the, it's just like idea one or idea one revision two B then you know if those if those things are cleared out from the beginning it's really helpful and besides the cue sheet as well Can you say that again? Yeah. yeah. Or share um, yours, if, or they can share what the one that they're working on, but just so that there's a common, um, not only language, but also a, a common way of, make, of keeping things organized. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when I was in school here, they taught us um, each script revision had a number and a color revision. You know, so you're able, you know, you're able to see pages as they come in. If you got a blue page, you know, or a yellow page, you know, all of those things. I mean, there there are conventions that people have been using for years that work. You know, you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, and the ones that people have been using for years are for w way bigger projects than the ones um, you know anyone sitting in this room is going to work on. So um, I would say that you know, if you can use those those tools that have already been established will also help you move to the next level when you have to go and interface with HBO or 
whoever because then you can talk to them in a language that they understand. Think about the amount of time that it's going to take to do it. Think about what kind of score you're asking for, whether there are going to be other musicians involved, whether there are going to be studios involved to record people, um, artist fees, and um, you're also purchasing the use of the material in your film. So it's like a couple of layers of what you're paying for. You're paying, for a, you're paying a license fee, you're paying a composer to do what they do, you're paying uh, uh, studio cost or whatever that's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and how much music is in the film. Uh, some films are like, you're in there from, from 01 to, you know, to the end. To, so, in some films it's very sparse. So, you can look at it and time-wise to see how many cues there are and that sort of thing, and you guys can haggle back and forth about that. Um, you, you really want to make sure that you pay someone so that they're comfortable doing what they're doing, because sooner or later, you're going to be up at 3 in the morning, <laughs> three nights in a row, <laughs> four nights in a row, trying to figure this out as the deadline approaches. and. Uh, uh, it's, and if you start early, again, it's better because you just don't want to be dissatisfied and feeling uncomfortable when you've got a week to go and, uh, you know, so uh, usually for a, um, an hour film or something like that, um, it's great to start talking around $10,000 and then going you know, depending on what it is up from there. It's a good place to start. You've, you've spent at least that much probably on camera gear, you know, so, no, food. <laughs> on food, you know. So, food. you know, you gotta you, you start there and then depending on what the project is, it can be, you know, that or twice that or, or three times that, it depends on what it is. I've never had to exceed three times that. It depends a lot on how, what, what, the, what the experience level of the composer is. I mean, you can, you know, I did scores for nothing for a long time because I wanted the experience. Uh, and uh, there are composers out there, you know, who, right now who want the experience really hard to get someone to trust you with their movie, you know. It's, I, I recommend other composers all the time that I know could do a great job for, for movies, but because they don't have a bunch of movies on their resume, People don't want to trust them with their movie, and I understand that. Um, so if you are, if you just don't have any, if you don't have, if you only have five thousand dollars or whatever, three thousand dollars, you know, and that really is all you have, then you're generally looking for someone who is hoping to get the experience and get the credit and will be enthusiastic at the end because they're getting that and because the movie you're working on is great. Um, that person is, it took me, I made a lot more mistakes at that point. You know, you're, you're not going to get like super efficiency out of someone who's brand new, but you can get a lot of great work. Um, if you're going with someone who is doing it for their living, then they need to make, you know, th then I think a sort of standard um, 
ITVS budget or something, you know, um, for a feature length film, it's between fifteen and twenty thousand dollars. You know, that, that's that's sort of what they would expect to see in the budget line, whether or not that's necessarily what the composer is actually getting. And generally, fees are all in. You know, so you decide what the composer decides. Okay, well, you, to realize your vision, I'm going to need to spend this much, um, and so you know the the fee has to cover that plus um, whatever they need to make, you know. So which goes up in the film. I mean, yeah. you, generally, whatever you're paying, you're going to get bang for the buck because we're going to find out, we're going to find the person, the, the recording, the situation that's going to make it sound exactly the way we're trying to get it to sound. So it's not like it's, you know, it's a frivolous thing. But also the deliverables have to be, you know, they're going to be pretty intense. So, you know, if uh, I, I got a gig working with a client, I'm not going to say who it is, but she had hired a great musician, someone I really respect, but he did not write for film. So he wrote these pieces, but they didn't fit into the film, and he couldn't write to the scene. And so the film had this, you know, the director said, oh, you know, I'm in trouble here. This is someone I love. We grew up with them, and but this is what they this is what they sent me. I said, well, it's not movie music, <laughs> you know. So it really helps. You know, sometimes you want somebody to play shortstop. You gotta you gotta find a shortstop. You know, so uh, it's not money. It's money well spent if you can find somebody who can really do it. But there are people, like he said, there are people who you know can do it. Like, I got pulled into doing some of this stuff before I knew I could do it. But someone who see me do something else said, oh, this is what, you, you can do this. So if you know that, and you're a producer, and that's part of a producer's job is to find talent and identify talent. If you know that person is right for it and can do it and can be guided through the process, then, then you should go for it. And I would also just add that um, as long as you have a, an understanding of how much the art craft is and, and you approach us, and even if you don't have that budget, um, I've had situations in which I, um, before, I, like you said, like sometimes you just wanted the experience, you're just starting, and, but sometimes I've had moments in which I'm in love with the film. And like, for example, this film, M Memories, and you know, Cecilia, don't tell her this, but I, if she had said, I had $50, I would be like, yes. Because I was like, this is the story of a lot of people that I love, right. and I want to be a part of that story as well. Um, so, and fortunately, um, we worked out a budget that was the ideal scenario, but because she was still looking for funding when she, when she found me and it was in the initial stages, then I laid out kind of like possible scenarios. So like, for example, like she said like, this is the, um, I was like, this is the least amount that I could do it for. And then that would, um, that would entail, for example, instead of a score to pictures um, soundtrack, that, then it would be more of like, I create five themes and then some variations on those. And it would be for this particular instrumentation. Then if we move to the next tier, it would be this. So there's also kind of um, some things in the middle that, especially if, if the composer is really invested in the film and, and, and it, there's a synergy there that, that extends be, beyond um, we are doing, of course, we're doing this for a living, but also there's a, a kind of a collaborative aspect of that too. Then, then there's some, I think, some some other things to consider in between. Yeah, if you're an experienced filmmaker, you're not necessarily getting all your funding up front. So, you know, everything you don't have to pay me all, you know, all in. I mean, you can pay me here and there, 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 because I know it's coming through. You know, it's coming through, and uh, maybe the the uh, broadcast. Uh, aspect of it, they're not going to pay you till you deliver, you know, and then six to eight weeks after that, so, you know. Terrible, but the music was terrific. 
And uh, second question, is there any uh, mystery behind your creative person? You said that you start seeing, is it like a psychic experience uh, or anything close to this? Well, um, can you repeat the first part of your last question? Uh, uh, can I mention something about it? I is there any mystery behind the creative pr uh, process? Uh, because you no notice that you like start seeing, hearing, is it a psychic experience or something um, close to this? No, there's, there's a lot of um, kind of notions of the uh, uh, very mystic notions of the composer sitting in front of the piano and the notes just coming um, to the composer. At least that's not me. Um, <laughs> And it's more of like a kind of situation and, um, and always feeling like, <laughs> like I'm faking it and like starting from nothing in every new piece. So, so I, at least for me, it, creativity, creativity comes from a place of like kind of chaos and, and, <laughs> and really deep internal conflict of like, you know, starting with a blank page and, who am I? What am I doing this again? Why? And like all these very existential things, and that's um, it, it might sound strange, but that's where I find a lot of, of creative kind of juices start flowing, um, and then I get I'm reminded of why I do this. And another for me, another thing that's very inspiring besides the like sounds around me and being aware always of the sounds, it's also working with young kids and in creative projects for me has been something that since I've been teaching, it's something that's really kind of fueled my creative process. And every time I'm, I, I, I tend to, sometimes I tend to forget that I'm, that music, that I'm doing this because it's fun and it's something that I love doing. And again, it's, it sounds like a given, but it's really easy to forget that when you do this for a living and when you're um, stuck on a scene and you've done 10 revisions of it. and or if you're starting a new piece and you don't know where to go or what you're going to say. So for me, I get ins a lot of inspiration from, from young kids that I teach and how they're, everything is exciting and new and, and re refreshing and, yeah. To your first question about whether it would be good to, um, for people to see a movie that uh, we worked on that and say that movie was terrible but the music was great, um, I think that's totally like not the job. I mean, I see, you know, I'm, I happen to do the music, but I, you know, see myself as part of the filmmaking team. And most of movies that I work on, I don't think people should even remember the music. You know, they would notice if it wasn't there, but they don't notice that they're noticing it that it is there. And that's what you know. That's that's what film music should be. Um, you know, I think. Evolution of a criminal. I was like, yeah. when the lights came on, who did your music? We need to talk about that. <laughs> but you love the movie. Yes. Yeah. But well, so I was also like, like, who the hell did your music? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yes, because I mean, I, I feel like with Darius, I had like a real connection. Like we really connected and we went somewhere, yeah. but we went somewhere that was the movie. You know what I mean? Um, okay, yes, yes. You, as opposed to like, you know, I just that movie sucked, but I love that sound. Right, right. Um, you know, it, it's 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 one entity. That's the thing. So that's what you're striving for. And when you're meeting composers and when you're working with a composer, you have to keep that in your mind that that's what you're going for. You're not going for the best music. You're going for the best movie, um, and that means that the music has to be very flexible and has to really, you know, become breathe with the movie. Uh, that's that's always the job. Bill's got the final word. Do it. Well, for Do me, uh, uh, in some of the films I've worked with, I'm sharing the screen with Harry Belafonte or uh, Ossie Davis and Ruby D. And you know, if I can keep up with them, <laughs> I'm doing a lot. You know, so I just want to be in the same room. So uh, and with people and actors and um, activists, and I do a lot of mu movies that are uh, documentaries that are about activism. Um, uh, it's hard to overshadow a really compelling um, 
activist. So, and if you do, then you're really doing something wrong. Uh, you, you went left when you should have gone right. Um, but you're there to support the story. So, um, now in a narrative, that's something different. But in documentary, uh, I'm just trying to keep up with them. You know, I don't really, I've, I've been fortunate to have projects where you have very compelling stories and compelling pr protagonists. So, um, uh, uh, it's all about support for me. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I, every word is important. So if, if you missed a word because I, I played something too loud or the wrong note in the wrong place or I accented something when I shouldn't have, then I'm doing a disservice to the telling of the story. I mean, every word has to be understood and, and digested and felt. So, and I'm there to sort of support that. And uh, as for the pro process, I, I, I am the opposite. I, I sort of just dream what, what I think should be there because I don't want to be limited by my, um, my technical skills on my instruments. So I dream at first and then I try to accomplish what's in the dream. <laughs> So I watch a film without the, temp, without the temp music. I got the temp music first so I know where things go, but then I take all the music out and then I dream a score. And then I try to get as much of that as I can and I hope they like it and hope you like it. <laughs> The dream is the final word. That's the final answer, right? So thank you all so very much. For